Uh, welcome everyone to uh, Kima Show Panel 5. Our subject today is the future of on-chain data utilization. Uh, my name is Guy Vider. I'm the co-founder and CTO of Kima. Um, Kima is uh, a decentralized inter, uh, interoperability layer. We basically allow people to settle transactions across multiple blockchains and off-chain, uh, move assets around, and uh, con connect the Web2 world to the Web3 world. Uh, <clears throat> with us today, we've gathered uh, four guests who have uh, substantial contribution to the area of on-chain data utilization. I would like to go around, uh, introduce the companies and let the people introduce themselves. So first, from <clears throat> uh, uh, Data AI, we have Ellie Azzi. Um Ellie, would you like to tell us a couple of words about... Uh, um, about your company, what you, what you guys are doing? Yeah, definitely. So first, thank you for uh, for having us on that panel. Um, very briefly, um, so we are we were a centralized data provider, and now we moved into becoming a decentralized data and analytics layer that is transforming raw blockchain data into actionable insight. So we simplify on chain data, we make it accessible for businesses and individual and allow them to take a uh, decision. Um, I'll let the decentralized part, I'll explain it maybe a bit later throughout the discussion because it will take a bit more time. Very happy to be here. Uh, most of the companies that are here, uh, we already know them uh, and we see a lot of synergy with them. So thank you for inviting us. Thank you, Ellie. Next, we have Nicholas Swellman from uh, Bubble Maps. Nicholas, hello. Hello. Hello, hello, everybody. Pleasure to be here. My name is Nick. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Bubble Maps, which is a, a fun and interactive way of exploring blockchain data. So what we try to do is really make on-chain data very accessible because it is the blood of the system. It is a reflection of everything that happens in our industry, but it is widely overlooked because I, I think Etherscan and, and some other analytical providers can be quite overwhelming sometimes. And by representing wallets with colorful bubbles, it's actually very efficient and very engaging at the same time. And on top of this, we, we actually have a very strong social media presence, especially on Twitter, where we, re we regularly share some investigations that we do. So we look into what happened on some of the tokens that are created. A lot of meme coins recently, of course, yeah. on Solana. <laughs> And uh, some of the celebrity launching tokens meta, but I'm sh I'm sure we'll have the opportunity to talk about this more in details. Yeah, absolutely. We'll be inter very interested to hear about that. Um, next, we have Philip from Cookie Three. Hey, Philip. Hi, guys. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. First of all, um, yep. So, short about me, I'm co-founder and uh, CEO of Cookie Three. Personally involved in crypto space since 2017. Uh, building Cookie Free since late 2021. Uh, right now, we are the biggest and most popular user analytics and uh, attribution analytics provider in Web3, uh, used by over 350 different dApps. Um, right now, we are focusing not solely on providing on-chain data, but also insights coming from in-platform. So you can think of us as a kind of a Google Analytics for Web3, uh, which we are providing actually as our uh, sole tech uh, for the dApps and platforms that are being built in Web3 space so they can uh, finally understand the user flows, marketing funnels, uh, customer acquisition costs, uh, lifetime value of the customers, and so on. So pretty basic metrics known from uh, Web2, but pretty challengeable to and hard to achieve and to actually measure in Web3 uh, where we are actually dealing with plenty of different data sources, both off-chain and on-chain, and we are the ones that are actually merging those in one um, funnel uh, of the users and uh, user journey. On top of that, we are also providing, uh, recently we started actually providing uh, Twitter um, and X um, insights, um, mainly focusing on the Kaya Wells, um, as we call all those like influencers, but also the like real key opinion leaders. 
So basically, we are helping uh, Web3 teams to understand from where their uh, most quality users are coming, uh, where to actually invest the budget uh, to make uh, your uh, user acquisition and marketing activities uh, most effective. Okay. effective. Thanks, Philip. And to conclude our amazing panel, uh, we have Martin from Chainaware. Hello, guys. I am Martin. I'm co-founder of Chainaware. So, okay, Chainaware, a short intro what we are doing. We are prediction engine. We predict what the wallets are doing in the future. So we started with a fraud detection. So we predict fraud happening in the future before it happens. 98% is a prediction accuracy. Then we did a rug pull detection, so we predict rug pulls happening in the future. And then we realized we can predict as well many other things, like a user behavior. Who is a borrower? Who is a lender? Who is a leveraged trader? Who is a gamer? Who is NFT? -er? So yeah, it's all the prediction engine. And then we connected the prediction engine with the targeting engine so that we can target. So it's a custom acquisition system. So for one side, we predict the behavior. From other side, we have the targeting engine to target the users. So that we get the customer acquisition rates up. So that's what you're doing in Chainover. So back to you. Nice. Thanks, Martin. So it sounds like uh, we have on our panel people who are dealing with the past, present, and future data on blockchain. So that that is interesting. We can, you know, basically encompass everything. Uh, and I'd like to start our, our panel with a couple of um, questions. And I'll basically pose the question, and we'll go around the table and hear how your particular uh, products. Uh, uh, address and target those issues. So let's start with uh, blockchain analytics. Uh, question to everyone on the panel. How does your platform innovate or enhance the analysis of blockchain data compared to traditional methods that currently exist? Uh, Ellie, let's start with you. You're there. Yeah, sure. So I would say that we have two main axes of innovation in our blockchain data analysis method compared to, trans to traditional methods. Um, so just a quick um, brief about us. So we've been in the space since 2021. And for the first year or two years, we're only uh, reporting DeFi, uh, DeFi positions. And we quickly saw a scalability issue when it comes to keeping up with the constant additions of chains and protocol. So of course, as a data provider, and I'm sure all the panel here agrees, you start with DeFi or NFT, and then we can start asking you transactions and then token balances and then more info like pricing on transactions and so on. So as a centralized data provider, it was too costly and too time consuming for us to continue integrating chains and protocols and so on. So we decided to take all our know-how that we've been building for the past three years and to open it up, uh, open up all the framework. How do you integrate a DeFi protocol? How do you calculate yield and so on to allow a community of developers and indexes to come and integrate new protocol with a standardized, with a standardized toolkit and a helpful structure in order to reach data complete, completeness faster and in a more scalable way. I mean, uh, as a data provider, we've always have requests. Can you add this chain? Can you add this protocol? Uh, dealing with a farm, hey, can you add this protocol that is launching in two weeks? <laughs> Although their smart contracts are not uh, available yet because they know that the API is going to be so high and they're going to trade on it. So this is the first act. So I would say we built a decentralized approach and uh, <clears throat> this decentralized approach will allow us to have a completeness of data that we'll be able to report. So second, because we've been in the space for the past three years, so we've accumulated enough data to start running our own machine learning model to automatically label and, categ and categorize smart contracts. So just to give you um, an idea, this year um, per day, 8,000 smart contracts are being deployed on all the chains. Imagine 8,000 smart contracts on all chains. So... <laughs> If you want to manually go and understand what those smart contracts are doing and to report to your customer, like whoever, is it a chain, is it a protocol, is it an accountant, is it a fund? I mean, it's crazy, right? So this task cannot be humanly done. So you need a machine to do it. You need a machine to understand a lot of data and to learn from that data to do it. And this is what we've been doing for the past year. We've been building a bit more our machine learning to be able to label and categorize smart contracts 
automatically, and this has been super helpful to uh, to understand user behavior and analytics and transaction analysis across several industries. So accounting, compliance, uh, funds, uh, chains, uh, protocols themselves. And we're launching the first version of um, of this ML categorization model in uh, November. So developers, they can build their application on top of that catalog of smart contracts that, uh, uh, that we've built. So I would say two things, one decentralization and second, uh, machine learning to build the biggest smart contract catalog uh, in the industry. Great. So yeah, so I actually take three things from you. So you also involve the community uh, and, and got- Definitely. Yeah. So that's definitely innovation. Uh, Martin, how about you telling us about the innovation in your uh, product and the approach you t- approaches you took? Okay, I can take, uh, I can speak ages, but let's be, try to compress it. So, yeah. okay, so maybe one, one thing, okay, as we started, we started to use a blockchain data to the fraud prediction. We created AI engines. We're using only blockchain data and we are predicting the fraud happening in the future, not in the past. Then we took the engines, we extended them and we started to predict drug codes. Now, okay, we have this on the Ethereum, we have it on the Binance chain or BNB chain. Now let's take on the BNB, there are 1,400 pools created per day, maybe some days, 1,500, other days, 1,400. And you know, a lot of them are up pulled. Now we predict this before it happens in the future. So it's a, and it's a real time, real time on chain data. But then, uh, like, uh, this, uh, step further that we are predicting as well a user behavior. We consider like fraud as a user behavior, or we consider like a rug pulls. Okay, that's in the case of contracts. That's a user behavior, a contract behavior. And we are predicting like a user behavior, like in a user next actions, user intentions. Now, if you are in the sales, you speak of the buyer intentions. We predict buyer intentions. Now, who is which persona? Who is doing what? So we're using practically blockchain data to calculate out the personas, the people behind these addresses. So, meaning what the user do as an X now, why is it relevant? Because if I'm selling something, if I want to do custom acquisition, I need to know who is the persona. Some guy is getting to my website, who is this guy? Like, what do I tell him? If he's a borrower, I have to tell something different if he's, uh, let's say, NFT dealer. So, practically, we use blockchain data. So, and uh, like, um, if you ask me what is the prediction, what is the innovation? So innovation is that we calculate the personas out of the blockchain data, and then we cal- uh, we connect this with the targeting system so that you can use this for the custom acquisitions. So we have personalized messaging. That's, that's um, maybe this one. Back yeah. to you. Yeah, sounds great. Uh, Nick, would you like to uh, tell us about the innovation of, of your product? Absolutely, my friend. So I think the biggest innovation we've made is to make on-chain data understandable. You know, on-chain data starts with a very interesting premise. It is there, it is public, anybody can see. But what good does it make if nobody understands this? And I think until until very recently, with only block explorers, was very, very tricky and very sophisticated. So I think the, what, we've, what we've done with BabMap, sorry, is by making this engaging and playful, we've onboarded a new generation of on-chain sleuth, on-chain user, and their first instinct now, before you take it, before you invest into any token, you check the map of the token. You check the bubble map of the token. Because the bubble map of the token, by showing the network of holders and how they're mutually connected, all of a sudden it unlocks so much value and so much insight. You can see who are the team wallets, who are the VC, who are the influencers, who are the insiders. And you can know for a fact that a token with control supply is going to dump on your face. It's going to end up is going to use you as exit liquidity. We have plenty of examples on this. Yeah. Our Twitter is actually filled with uh, <laughs> insider activity reports. Just today, we released a post about a token. I'm not going to name it, but you can check on our <laughs> feed. And uh, with a heavy control supply. I don't want to get into any controversy in this space. Okay, okay yeah. So supply. just uh, go to Bubble Maps, uh <laughs> Twitter to find out who's that. What token uh, Absolutely. is Nick talking about? Uh, and let's conclude this round with uh, Philip. Uh, again, innovation or you know something novel that your uh, product and your protocol is doing. Sure, of course. Uh, so basically, uh, what's special and unique in Cookie Free is that we are uh, providing on-chain data in the context of the particular project 
so the team uh, like product team management marketing team can understand the flow of the users uh, in terms of the attribution so the sources from where those users are coming uh, in what kind of rates uh, effectively they can uh, compare that to the costs and the spending for the particular activities that they are conducting in terms of their marketing uh, campaign and uh, any other activities they are spending any budget on. Uh, so basically, thanks to Cookie Free, you can basically not only check uh, what are the historical activities of the particular users and their behaviors on chain, uh, but actually you can compare it to their behaviors within the platform that you are providing within your D app because uh, like not everything happens on chain as we know like many transaction signs uh, behaviors time spent uh, uh, has to be captured off chain so this is what we are providing as a kind of a complementary tool for providing this whole picture of the user base uh, on top of that one of our like newest features is Kyle intelligence where we are providing uh, pretty unique and original uh, approach to providing on-chain data because we are providing uh, engagement rates and generally all of the elements of the metrics coming from Twitter uh, compared to the on-chain events, uh, behaviors, activities, token performance uh, differences and like different uh, actions compared to those uh, like activities of the Kyle Wells. So as a project owner you can or marketer within the project you can basically check how specific Kai Wells, how specific content creators are actually influencing, for example, usage of your D app, because we can compare uh, based on the same time timestamp uh, how specific content creators are influencing the traffic uh, with your smart contracts or the performance of your token and so on and so forth. So this is how uh, in which we are specializing <coughs> and how we are <coughs> towards mm. of, uh, <coughs> data. Cool. So, uh, you know, that, that would all definitely allows people to, uh, you know, whenever a new D app or a new protocol comes along to understand who's dealing with it. Uh, is it being influenced by a small group of people, meaning, you know, maybe it's a, a pump of some sort. So, you know, systems like yours, uh, all four of those systems are um, becoming essential tools in uh, uh, understanding data on chain. And as someone who dealt with a lot of data over his development life, uh, I have a question around the user experience. So we all know, you know, it's easy to collect data. It's very hard to present the results of data analysis and uh, data collection in a way that, you know, regular humans would be able to consume uh, the results of your research. So let's go quickly uh, around the table and ask, you know, what steps uh, are you taking in your application to make sure that the data that you uh, manage to collect, you manage to collate and manage to uh, research is presented to the users in a, a consumable way? Uh, let's start with Nick this time. Yeah, I'm happy to take this one. So essentially, when we started Bubble Maps, we had a lot of ideas on what we wanted to implement, a lot of verticals. On-chain data is very dense, so you, there is so much data you can present. But we've decided to focus on one very specific vertical, which was understanding the network of holders for a particular token. So when you have a certain token, you know, you have holders. And uh, we decided that every bubble would represent one of those holders, the bigger the bubble, the more these holders would have. And then by connecting bubbles on the screen, you can see the holders who are connected together, indicating potential collusion or some specific tokenomics design. So you can visualize the tokenomics of a token. And then what we've done when we have presented this information, we wanted to stay very, very simple in the way that we present this information. And what we've done later on is we've incrementally improved the product by sticking to this very simple or straightforward idea of a bubble map. We didn't want to expand into other ideas, other segments, because we've had something going on and we were the first mover. We actually were the first company to show this idea of a bubble map. So what we've done later on is we've integrated bubble maps on other platforms. This way, we're not saying if you want to see the bubble map of a token, you have to come on bubblemaps.io. You can go on OpenSea. And on OpenSea, Bubble Map is integrated, so you can check the map of NFT collection. 
or you can go on deck screener because on deck screener now there's a tab that directly shows the bubble map of the token you're looking mm-hmm. at or you can go on pump fun pump fun as well integrated the map so this was I'm, I'm i know i'm talking more from a strategical perspective but i think it's super important as a creator as an entrepreneur to try to diversify how your um, how your idea are presented and we really try to make this spread like wildfire within web3 on top of this if you want to make your tool very understandable this will be my my last point you have to build a lot of education educational content around it and this is why our twitter initially when we started at our twitter it was just a form of marketing how to present this information to the user but then it became it became something more quite quite unexpectedly and we became one of the leading investigative company in crypto and now where we share a thread it creates heated debates conversations and this is exactly what we're looking for cool thanks nick and i i really like the fact that uh your uh ui is part of the name of your company uh bubble maps so that that certainly helps yeah man like <laughs> it is it is a way to make it very clear and i would i would like to add something it is actually quite a flattering thing that people now refers to a bubble map as a common name like it the bubble map of a token sometimes people forget that a company is called bubble maps <laughs> behind it has just become a a common wording and it's a, it's a very it's a gift for us well if you ask google that's a good problem to have right now everyone is calling searching googling so that's a good way to go Uh Philip, would you like to tell us about the UX advances uh in your platform? Of course. Yep, so basically <coughs> uh we took the approach that uh we we weren't able to and like weren't likely willing to invent the wheel once again and actually we were basing on the legacy of web2 in terms of what kind of dashboards and how we can present specific um metrics for the marketers <coughs> that were already using specific uh analytics toolings and user insights um platforms won't be hard to actually merge to use cookie free in web3 and basically that was one of the first approaches we took uh on top of that we are actually iterating uh like always and <laughs> forever i would say uh we are very um feedback focused and our like quick feedback loop is uh is actually uh running uh pretty fast in terms of iterations so for example the mentioned uh kyol intelligence that was released i guess a month ago right now we are releasing today the third version of it already basing on the feedback of like over 20 different companies that already use that so basically uh we are mainly uh doing it uh in the approach of providing it based on the feedback of our business clients because if something is and again we are also using our own tracking tools to track whether specific uh features are being used or not and if not uh we can come up with some conclusions about the reasons of that uh about the like uh bad uh ux uh for example that might be the uh cause of it and so on and so forth so basically i would say it's the like the ongoing process that we are um uh, that is not ending up anyway in the future it's just like uh going forever iterating and improving uh i think we can also mention here that um uh, as our tool is very complex i would say because as i said we are utilizing not only on chain data from 26 chains but also uh in platform data twitter data telegram data so basically there are a ton of different data sources that we are using um so it's actually hard to provide it everything in one place uh we are making it much more customizable for the users so uh different users can have different layers of the data that they are actually utilizing on the platform uh, and this is kind of a personalization uh and being more more tailored to the specific users than having one uh dashboard for everyone okay thanks philip uh martin same question ux and accessibility of data to the user 
Well, okay, let me start a little bit from different corners. So, okay, Web3 marketing now. And then we get to the UX now. Web3 marketing, we are, you see, it's a mass marketing now. But what we enable with the chain of that, this is a personalized marketing. Now, Web3 marketing, you know, you use KOLs, you use Etherscan, you put some banners there, you use crypto media, you make some articles in a coin telegraph, all mass marketing now. Now, what is all impact to the UX is so if the users are visitors are coming now to the platforms, 50,000 Web3 projects, maybe 60,000. When users, visitors are coming to these platforms, they will get personalized messages, personalized, which are for their profile, for their intention. So we, we can speak like a UX as a way to use like the application, but we are saying uh, we are an engine. We are an engine which is calculating the things, then the marketing guys, they are defining the messages, visualization, so, and on the end, it's for the users getting personalized messages, and uh, so it's uh, and that's all impact on the UX. So it's, uh, if you say like how we visualize the data, we give the tools to marketers to make personalized messages to the users. So based on user intentions. So um, did I explain it? Or <laughs> you tell me. Yeah, absolutely. And okay. Just, this round, uh, Ellie, same question. Yeah, thank you. So for us, the question is a bit harder to, to, to answer since we're a network of data that we're selling data. But um, just to cover it for, to, to, to the first question, being a data provider in, in Web3 is, is challenging because let's think about who was the first data provider in Web3, Etherscan. Etherscan was built maybe, I don't remember, maybe, maybe in 2016 after Ethereum was built. It was used in 2017 because every day you had maybe five to 10,000 transactions, right? But now if you think about Ethereum, like how many transactions do you have per day? Millions, right? So this is not the right tool because today, if you ask anyone, why are you using Etherscan? It's just to prove that you sent a transaction or you send a transaction hash to someone just to, for them to say, ah, okay, I received my salary or you paid, um, you, you paid a, a provider. And then came all the folks, like all the people that are here on the us and all the people that are here on the on on this panel, uh, to start going into more details, into more vertical. So, for example, we decided to go into DeFi, uh, Bubble Maps. They decided to go into um, token. Um, and to answer your question about uh, the about the UX, we are a data network. We provide data, but we saw that. Users, if you don't provide them with an end uh, product, it's very difficult to show them the power of the data that you have. So this is why we we build tools on top of our data, on top of our network. One of them is called Merlin. So Merlin is a, a DeFi portfolio analytics. Anyone can go visit it. It's for free, myMerlin.io. The difference is that not only you can see your DeFi positions, but you can see your performance. So we're able not only to understand a snapshot of your positions today, but what you did in the past. It's very important because the wallet that has ten dollars today might have been a millionaire at some point and they've been trading on Ave or Compound and they generated a lot of yield and they removed everything from the wallet. So the historical information are very important and this is what we do. The second thing is um, another platform that we created, we're launching it next uh, month as um is mainly for on base. And it's a performance tool to compare yourself as a base user uh, with your historical uh, transaction versus another user that is on base. Am I in the top 10% of uh, Aerodrome or another application? And finally, we're working on a unified and standardized uh, way that blockchain data is fetched so that you're getting it from Solana, EVM, Move, you will have the same unified data structure. So any data provider or any application that wants to build on top, any developer, instead of them uh, getting all the information from different providers, structuring it, uh, it's very easy to, 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 be, to be understood and even non-tech person can access this data and start using it. So that's okay. it. Cool, yeah, and I actually use Merlin uh, once, so yeah, I recommend everyone go and check it out. Um, Next question is actually uh, near and dear to my heart and has to do with uh, privacy and data security. So all of the protocols mentioned here collect a lot of data and 
at one point, you know, including on and off data, as, as some of you have mentioned, at one point you are able to basically pinpoint uh, and collect user information uh, and, and, and have some very uh, touchy and private data in your, uh, uh, in your collection. So my question to you, and uh, let's try to keep it short and to the point on this one, is how are, how is your protocol dealing with sensitive personal blockchain uh, data, transactions, uh, PII, if you touch any of that, just to ensure the, you know, the users and the listeners to, you know, that, that you're dealing with them in a, you know, a, a, um, proper and, and secure way. Um, let's start with Martin this time. Oh, okay. Hey guys. Oh, very good question. Now, let me just say that we are using on chain data only. Now, the issue with GDPR and uh, personalized identifying information, this is accurate now when we start to connect the other data, the other relevant data so that we can map the user data into the real identities. Who is this person, physical person, physical address, physical phone number, and so on. That's when the problem occurs. Now, if, but you can simplify uh, the situation a lot from a regulatory point of view, like if you focus only on the on-chain data. Now, if you don't start now to mix on-chain and off-chain data, you just say, I'm on-chain data, it's a public data. And now from all point of view, what we are doing, we are predicting behavior. So practically we are clustering now the data together in so-called micro segments. And by the way, this is nothing different from Google, Twitter, or Facebook are doing. All of these three are um, at the components. They are predicting user behavior and based on the user behavior, then the ad technology is working on them. So we have this micro segmentation. Now, the issue is occurring when you connect the personalized identified information. But if you stay now on-chain only, like you make predictions on-chain only without knowing who is the gentleman behind, uh, you are still in the anonymized um, environment. And as long as you stay in an anonymized environment, so you are kind of uh, clean. So <laughs> let's say it in this way. Of course, the situation now that you refer to, it, it occurs when you start now to connect the data with an off-chain data, with the identities and so on. But we decided, we discussed this, we said we stay on-chain only. That's it. That's it. Set two. <laughs> we are not connecting off-chain data. And that's how we simplified the situation. So back to you. Understood. Uh, Nick? Privacy? How do you keep your data private and secure? Nick, are you there? Okay. Uh, Hello? Yep. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, we'll cycle back to you. Uh, so I'll address the question with uh, Ali. How do you guys keep your data secure and private? Yeah, this is a very tricky question. <laughs> Especially Martin said it. Like if you're uh, treating with on-chain data, I mean, the data is there. Right, uh, it's just that uh, it's not easy to understand it. Um, but we deal with some. Uh, some of our customers are crypto accounted and and crypto fund, and and you know that this is very sensitive data. So even though the, this data is publicly available, um, it's it's complex and hard to to interpret to interpret to interpret this data. So we specialize in decoding and making sense of this raw data, turning it into useful uh, insight for our clients. So. By doing this, we help understand the necessary information without exposing, exposing any additional sensitive data. On the security side, because per, I mean privacy, I can't say a lot because this data is available. But on the security side, um, we're taking a minimalist approach to data storage. So we don't store any personal data from our customer. So we are operating our own archive node. And most of those nodes, the data that we need are already indexed. So this means that we only collect and use the data that's necessary for our client, which is reducing the risk associated with storing sensitive information um, on our servers. So for example, with crypto accounting, we don't even know who are the end customers. Uh, with data providers that are using us, we don't even know who are the end customers. So we don't store any information about the wallet that they request from the network. Interesting. Yeah. And, uh, that, that is an important point you mentioned to people. Everything you do on the blockchain is available for everyone to see. Uh, and you know, the data will be there. So even if the tools today can only show one part of the data, the tools tomorrow will still have the same data and, and the ability to, to dig into, 
uh, into current yeah. transactions, right? So yeah, it's just about time until everything would be understandable, but uh, everything will be understandable. <laughs> exactly. Okay, uh, let's move on to the next question. Um, and I would just go, what would like to go around the panel and um, ask whether you can highlight one real world use case of your existing uh, technology right now, something that our listeners could connect to. Obviously, you know, nothing private and nothing that uh, uh, you cannot mention. Uh, but if there is like one case where your technology was used or is being used in uh, in an interesting use case uh, that you can highlight. Uh, if, if you're not comfortable with it, just say next and we'll move to the next person. So Ellie, let's start with you this time. Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, being a data provider and network operator of data, I see a lot of use cases. Uh, one of the use cases that I really like because I never thought about it. And in fact, it, it was mainly a problem that was brought up by our customers. So this is how you should build your product. It's mainly for accountants. Um, so today, accountants, they use the number of transactions to be able to price their customers. But the customer can have a million transactions only by uh, send and receive, while another customer who has a thousand transactions is only staking, uh, borrowing, uh, bridging, and so on. So they're using our data to better price their customers based on the complexity of their wallet instead of basing it on the number of transactions. Well, this use case, I never thought about it when we started building the product and it came to us and a lot of accounting are using our tool today just to price their customers. Interesting. Uh, Nick, real world use case? Yeah, there's, there's so much. Actually, as I said earlier, if you go on our Twitter, you will see plenty of uh, real case applications. Yeah, something Isn't you can share with our listeners here? Absolutely, my friend. Yeah. So, for example, during the celebrity launching tokens meta, remember when Iggy Azela and Andrew Tate, Sean Kingston, uh, just to name a few, were launching tokens. Essentially, by looking at the map of those tokens very quickly, you could understand that the celebrities were owning, whether the celebrities or insiders were owning a large percentage of the supply and it was not publicly disclosed. So what happened most of the time is the celebrities, they launched token on, on Pump Fun. It was on Pump Fun. And they snipe a large amount of tokens at launch on Pump Fund directly before the liquidity is on radium. And then when they tweet about it, they already own so much of the supply that they can sell for basically hundreds of thousands and even millions of dollars sometimes by using their community as an exit liquidity. So for, for the average user, before investing, you check the map, you see there's any shady cluster going on, any weird concentration of connected address. And then you know that something is going on behind the scenes. And like, it was funny this period of time because a lot of the celebrities were, were coming against Babo Maps, like, oh, you guys are full of shit. Jason Derulo, for example, he was uh, very pissed off because we managed to find one of his address that he used to sell behind the scenes. He, he, he publicly disclosed one address and the other he didn't say, but it was part of the same cluster. So sorry, Jason. <laughs> You were called red-handed. Yeah. And yeah, like those are some, those are some examples. It works very well for meme coins, but it also works very well for serious tokens. In Uniswap, as an example, on the map of Uni, you can see there's a couple of clusters going on and it's actually super interesting because their governance has turned into a political battlefield where you have many political parties, uh, we can frame it that way, who are fighting each other to control the governance of Uni. Think about it. There is billions of dollars in stake, at stake. So if you control the governance of uni, you, you win significant amount of money. And we found all the wallets from A16Z, Anderson Horowitz, and they used to have 4.15% of the supply. And if you have more than 4%, you can pass votes on your own. This is called the quorum of Uniswap. Yeah. The quorum is at 4%. So by having 4.15, they were essentially just controlling the governance entirely. So from the noble idea of democracy, what we said is Uniswap is turning into an oligarchy with certain few controlling the governance. Here are just a couple of examples, but again, I could spend a lot of time going through them. Yeah, and I urge uh, listeners to go on your Twitter and read about the other cases. Uh, Philip, uh, can you tell us about the real world, real world uh, use case? For sure. 
Uh, yeah, so basically, I would say one of the, uh, like, even recently, um, during Token 2049 in Singapore, we were experiencing those, like, High Well Awards conference, uh, which was, pre- like, pretty viral on crypto Twitter in terms of the winners of it, which were pretty uh, surprising. Um, and, like, most of those folks are unknown for more most of the Web3 builders that are uh, active in this like uh, crypto Twitter inner circle, uh, and basically the Kyle intelligence that we are providing is uh, actually one of the tools that is evaluating the quality of the real attention and like real voice and real impact uh, on the audience. So we are uh, as like bubble maps, maps is for example detecting specific like bad act- actors that are sniping the tokens. Uh, before providing the liquidity, we are actually sniping, uh, we're detecting the bots that are being active, uh, for example, on Twitter and are uh, creating some fake, fake engagement for those so-called KOLs that are in fact not, not, not the leaders, but actually uh, they are having most of the engagement artificial one and comparing to the on-chain stats. Uh, so the token performance, for example, of specific tokens that they are shilling, this is where, uh, like, the pure validation of their uh, content creation, of their impact, is actually happening. So we see that there are plenty of different um, influencers in crypto space uh, that are pretending to be those influencers. In fact, they are not. And we see it on the on-chain data that their activities... Uh, are not giving any impact on uh, the token price performance, on the uh, usage of the smart contracts of the projects that they are shilling. Uh, so those are the things that uh, I can uh, name as a like recent case studies that we are providing for a few of our clients. Thanks, Philip. And uh, let's conclude this round with Martin. Uh, real use. Uh, real world use case of your uh... Uh, thank you we we think the biggest use case it's a customer acquisition it's an ad tech it's a web3 ad advertisement technology slash customer acquisition now if you calculate user personas meaning you know who is who like you can't calculate users risk willingness like how much risk does he want to take different people have different risk willingness his experience his intentions you target him you target him with personalized messages meaning the user is coming to your website you place okay little advertisement for China where you place a little widgets there, uh, little technology there, and you address him with a personalized messages. So instead of that, the user is coming to one website where he's fully anonymous. He's seeking some he's seeing some anonymous cool statements, but he's not resonating with them. Now, if he's not resonating, he's not converting. Now, for user slash visitor to convert to the real user, he has to resonate with your platform with your website. Now, how do you get to the reson- resonance? You have to create resonating messages for you. How to get to resonating messages? You have to first calculate who the user is. So the very real use case, or back to your question, is it's the customer acquisition. You calculate user intentions, experience, risk willingness, and based on this, you place into messages to convert, and or you decide not to deal with these users. For example, if you have fraud detection technology, you can say, I don't want to deal with users who have like too high probability. I want to deal only with the clean, clean stuff. But back to this question, it's the targeting. Because um, let's see, then, from this way, like uh, we just uh, calculated it. It's very simple. There are 50,000 Web3 projects. There are 50 million Web3 users, plus minus now. It makes 1,000 uh, users per project, but <laughs> most of the projects don't have 1,000 users. The users are very highly concentrated. And why? Because the customer acquisition is not working. Why? Because there's no personalization. So that means this personalization, that's a very huge, huge use case. And we think it will it will help all these Web3 projects. You know, long tail of a lot of Web3 projects with a very low number of users, real users. I'm not speaking of hype marketing. Not speaking of, um, you know, uh, creating visibility and awareness. I'm speaking of projects who are creating technology, who want to get real users, who want to really make difference with this uh, technology. They will need real users and how to get these users. And that's where this technology helps. So back to you. Thank you. Uh, and we got to the final question uh, before we go to the flash round. Uh, so in this round, I just would like to ask our, our founders here to tell us about 
an upcoming feature or development that users can look forward uh, to in your platform. So something new and exciting uh, coming up soon. Uh, Ellie, let's start with you. Yeah, definitely. So, uh, I mean, uh, the next big thing for us is um, launching to the to the public this decentralized network but that we've been working on on it. So, what does it mean? It means that instead of just providing data, we're creating the the largest Web three data infrastructure where developers and infrastructure provider they actually uh, run and own the network. So, with this launch, user they will be able to access real time blockchain data that's already categorized, decoded. Make it, make, make, making it easier to understand and use. And this is going to be a game changer, especially for all our customers that need quick, accurate insight without having to go through tons of uh, data. On top of that, developers will be able to build their own application on our platform, which gives them a lot of flexibility. They can create custom tools for whatever they need while being part of a decentralized network that's uh, built for scale. And the most valuable thing um, of this network is the completeness of the data. So as um, uh, as Chris mentioned, uh, I mean, a lot of applications, a lot of chains, a lot of new projects being created every day. It's very hard to keep up with um, uh, with all those advancements, all those new protocols that are being created. Having a decentralized network where developers, they can come, they can add protocols or the protocols themselves, they can add it using a standardized way that we're creating. Uh, this will uh, provide a clearer understanding of what users are doing uh, on chain. So there's a lot of coming and can't wait for uh, to put this um, network in the hands of the people. Thanks, Ellie. And uh, what uh, user on Twitter do you recommend people follow to get the latest news on your project? It's a very tricky question because for rebranding from Merlin to Datai, uh, the best way um, is to follow Merlin for now because Merlin is uh, the, the the Merlin is called Built on Merlin um, on Twitter. So follow us. Uh, we'll be announcing the um, the rebrand to Datai Network and the launch of the network in November. Thanks, Ellie. Uh, Nick, in exciting things you're about to launch soon. Oh, my friend, absolutely, absolutely. Um, we are launching our V2 very soon, before the end of the year. And uh, it will show some very unique features. Like one of them is historical data, meaning that on the V1 right now, you can only see the current token distribution. But on the V2, you can rewind the tape and see how a token started. We call this Big Bang because it physically looks like the, like the Big Bang when you have initially one address holding all the token supply, and then you can see this bubble explodes like a financial big bang as the first holders come in and the exchanges and the market makers. And it is incredible to witness. It's also very insightful because those are usually when the most important thing happens, when the insiders come in and when you have the large stakeholders who manage to get a significant amount of the supply. So those are exactly the amounts that you want to focus on this first second of a token launch. Number two, the second part that excites me is, let's call this an AI model that managed to recreate clusters directly on the map. Because let me give you an example. Let's say you have one address holding 30% of the supply of a token, okay? And then you decide to dispatch, to disperse those 30% into 30 wallets, one person each. What would happen is because the initial wallet is now empty, then the cluster is not visible on the map because we're only looking at holders of a token. And because the one in the middle has sent everything out, it is now empty, so it's not a, it's not a bubble. And therefore, the 30 wallets are not going to be connected, which is a huge, which is a huge misleading information. You would see, you would believe everybody's appear to be disconnected when, it, when it's not the case. So with the V2, we're actually adding this AI model to recreate clusters that that are gone missing on the bubble map. So now nobody can nobody can escape the bubble map. It is very very powerful. With uh, in, com- in combined with uh, historical data, it is scammers' worst nightmare. Cool. And uh, I'm assuming bubble maps is the uh, address people should follow to see uh, releases. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Bubble Maps on Twitter, Bubble Maps on Telegram, I think Bubble Maps that I own Discord. And that's pretty much it. Very good. Uh, Philip, new and exciting things coming for your protocol? Yeah, sure. So basically, uh, we are going to add uh, non EVM and on chain analytics. So the first one will be like the first two ones actually will be Solana and Ton. Basically, we are very, very bullish on both. And uh, together with Ton on chain analytics, we are also uh, starting to provide mini apps integration support. So, any mini app on Telegram are already able and uh, like to integrate with our script and to gather information in terms of the in platform uh, insights and behaviors. On top of that, we will add also a poten- uh, possibility of merging it with like ton on chain data. Uh, and basically, we are expanding in terms of the Kaiwal intelligence. Uh, right now, it's like narrowed down to the context of specific campaigns and projects, but we'll be actually uh, expanding it much uh, wider in terms of the uh, research part of the Kaiwals in the space. Okay. And uh, which user on Telegram should people follow to? Find out new and exciting things. Philip, if you're there. Sorry. Which, which Twitter or Telegram or Discord uh, handle people should follow to uh, find out about yeah. interesting sure. things? You can, go, you can go to my uh, profile and in bio. Uh, uh, go to Cookie Free and follow us on Twitter. Uh, basically, right now we are actually hiring. So if you are looking for any job as well, that might be also a good stake for you. Cool. And finally, Martin, tell us about new and exciting things on your protocol. Okay, actually, we have so many exciting things already. Like I spoke about Web3 technology, Web3 advertisement technology that we have, but we have, okay, that's from more for the businesses. It's a business to business. But we have for individuals, like every individual can use a fraud detector, you know, predictive fraud detector, meaning before it happens. They can use a pull detector, meaning before it happens, not after it happens. Okay, credit score, if someone is interested on his credit score, there is a wallet auditor. You take, for example, Vitalik and uh, Vitalik.eth and you check what are his intention, what is his risk profile, what is his experience. Oh, we have Telegram bot that you can do all this functionality from Telegram. We have Discord bot, you can do all the same things from Discord. And now on Web3 Attack, um, okay, we are monetizing our Web3 Attack, all our calculations that we are doing. I mentioned before that we can target uh, based on the on the experience and on the risk willingness, like a willingness to take a risk. It's in development, will be launched very soon. At the moment, the targeting is based on intentions and we will add and targeting as well based on willingness to take a risk, um, based on the experience. So we are working in small iterations and every week, every week we are adding functionality. So uh, yes. back to you. And uh, the account people should follow or the, the handle? It, it's chain of Chain aware. Just on Twitter. Chain aware. Very easy. Cool. So uh, with this, we concluded our formal uh, questions to our founders here. Uh, and what we usually conclude with for the last, you know, three, four minutes is what we call the flash round, which are a bunch of just random DeFi and, and crypto questions. Uh, I just want to mention here, this is not investment advice. No one here is committed to anything. Uh, no one here is recommending anything. So... Let's go quickly. Uh, uh, feel free, any 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 one of you four, just to chime in with an answer. So, if I were to give you a thousand dollars to uh, buy a stablecoin, would you buy USDC or USDT? Anyone? That's a tricky one, man. Tricky one. I would say USDT because they've made so many billions recently. Hopefully, they've cleaned the books. Cool. Uh, oh, okay, I'm, I'm adding here, uh, like if you look on the US dollar, you have a uh, so-called euro dollar, that's a dollar outside of the Fed control, and there is a dollar in the United States. So like USDC is then the dollar under the you know, United States control, and the USDT is the outside, like a euro dollar equivalent. So you Correct. kind of need both. Yeah. Okay, so let's make it more interesting. You know, uh, that that's a stable coin question, so you can't really lose a lot. But if I were to give you a $1,000 and tell you you need to buy Dodge, or SHIB, what would you buy? So now we're veering into meme coin territory. Ellie? Honestly, I would keep them in your city. <laughs> but if I have to answer, but if I have to answer, I'm not a very big, big uh, meme uh, 
I think they don't play uh, in a good shape of the industry. But uh, if I have to, uh, I, w- I would say Dodge. <laughs> Okay. Oh, okay, I will show them. Oh, okay, not against Elon Musk and the company, but you, you see, I, th- I think it's a, it's a, it's a trend, it's a narrative, and every narrative has its end, and when a narrative has its end, then I think shorting is the, we, of course, we don't know when the shorting uh, narrative right. starts. So, okay. I have a very easy answer, yeah, if you go want. Go for it. The answer is Doge, because the founder of SHIB owns 20% of the circulating supply, We've made many threads about this, and the guy, if he decides to start, if he starts selling, ship is dead. Wow. Okay. That's a very compelling answer. Like, <laughs> no comeback from that. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Let's make it a little bit uh, more relevant to our uh, uh, industry. If I were to give you a ticket to either Blockchain Paris or Token 2049 in Singapore, which one would you take? I live in Paris, so I'll stay in my neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that was an easy one for you. Anyone else? Yeah, I lived a long time in Paris, so I would say Token 2049. I was just coming back from Singapore. It was really exciting, so yeah. Yeah, it was a, it was a good one. Yeah. Uh, okay, and let's finish with another one. So we talked about DeFi projects. We talked about uh, on-chain, off-chain data. Uh, if you needed to convert a token, you know, to another token, would you go to a DEX or would you go to a centralized exchange? Okay, we are definitely for the DEXs. It's a, it's a Web3 narrative, on-chain data. Plus 10, uh, I, I think it's a Web3. It's okay. a DEXs. Anyone else? Yeah, I would, pick, I would pick the DEX as well, just to stay true to what I'm actually building. Plus... I don't want to give my Cowboys information everywhere. Yeah, yeah, sure. You're right. I, I would definitely choose Dex uh, because of what we're doing, or else people they will not trust us. Trust, trust us. But if you look at the uh, at the rate, you would definitely go with the central exchange because <laughs> market makers will make it much uh, uh, much cheaper for you to to exchange. Honestly, cool. Okay, and with that, let's conclude uh, today's uh, panel. I would like to thank my four panelists, Ellie from Data, Data AI, Nick from Bubble Maps, uh, Philip from Cookie3, and uh, Martin from ChainAware. Uh, you now know where to find them and where to follow them uh, to uh, pick up on new and exciting uh, releases. I want to thank you all for joining us today on the, the Kima Network uh, show panel and look, looking forward to meeting you on uh, future panels and in real life if possible. Uh, Thanks, everyone, and have a great day, night, afternoon, wherever you are. Uh, Signing off. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.